I'm here today representing the Taxpayers' Union. I'm not a member of any political party. I may have once been in the media. I am no longer. I never will be again, I don't think, for three reasons. My age, my race and my gender. <laughs> and the fact that in my last job as a radio talkback host, I was not afraid to criticise and question government policy, not just on the issue in front of us today, but on other fronts as well. When the government becomes not just the biggest single advertiser in the commercial media through the Ministry of Health, as well as making direct cash contributions to large commercial media organisations like the New Zealand Herald Stuff and Media Works, then you know full well we have a very serious uh, issue in this country, and that is a media which is literally bought and paid for. And don't let anyone tell you any different. The so-called public interest journalism fund is a classic case in point. Now, for media organisations to access a little slice of this $55 million slush fund, it must, and I quote, actively promote the principles of partnership, participation and active protection under Te Tiriti o Waitangi, acknowledging Māori as a Te Tiriti partner." Unquote. Now, from where I come from, journalism is not actively promoting anything. Journalism is about offering all sides of a story, examining facts around the issues and leaving the reader, the viewer or the listener to make up her or his mind on an issue. So when, you, so when you have a media dipping into this fund, and the Herald and Stuff in particular have taken sizeable chunks from it, in the case of the New Zealand Herald over $2 million, and with Stuff nearly a $1 million, when they have taken that sort, that amount of taxpayers' money, then there is no chance, really, that the salient facts about water and water infrastructure and the plans for it will be discussed openly and honestly in our media. That's the struggle, you see, that we as citizens face in this country. This government, which unfortunately for now can do what it pleases because of its parliamentary majority, is about to confiscate from local authorities the infrastructure for reticulating your drinking and washing water, the infrastructure for flushing it all away, as well as the pipes and drains that ensure your place mostly does not flood during a major storm. So those are what this government has called the three waters, tap water, waste water and storm water. At the moment, it is the responsibility, of course, of your local council to build, maintain and expand the water infrastructure inside the boundaries of its local authority. Now, some councils, of course, do this better than others. We know that some councils don't do it very well at all. The most infamous example of that was the 2016 incident in Hastings when the Havelock North system became infected with some lurgies and it made some people very sick. But according to the official inquiry after that uh, outbreak of disease, the problems in the water, quote, may have contributed to the deaths of three people. And has there been any widespread waterborne disease in New Zealand since? Answer, no. Yes, there is the continuing issue, continuing issue with the old sewerage pipes in Wellington and the fact that they seem to burst on a regular basis. I know from the experience of living in Auckland that the stormwater system in the suburbs close to the city is hopelessly out of date and incapable of coping in a heavy storm. In fact, stormwater and sewage often seem to get mixed up way too often, and there's contamination flowing into the harbour, many beaches in the harbour become unswimmable. Therefore, in Auckland there's a major project underway called the Central Interceptor. Hopefully it will keep sewage out of the stormwater system when the project is finished at some stage in the next decade. But mention of the Central Interceptor has been noticeably absent during discussion of this Three Waters scheme. You see, Auckland's water agency Watercare is well aware that there is a major problem with the ageing pipe, so it is spending $1.2 billion to build this 15 kilometre long sewerage tunnel underground at a 1 to 1,000 downhill gradient from Greylin under central Auckland out to the sewerage ponds at Mungaree. The point is, 
that Auckland's water care knows full well there is a problem and they're doing their best to fix it. The ratepayers and the water users of Auckland who will benefit from the scheme will pay for it. It won't be easy, but for the sake of hygiene and health it's got to be done and it will never be cheaper than what it is now. But water care did not need a regional water entity formed by Wellington bureaucrats and politicians to tell them a major piece of sewerage infrastructure had to be built. They did it themselves, they knew it had to be done. Some other councils are well aware that there is some serious work needed in various places around the country, but not everywhere. Later on this afternoon we'll hear from Nobby Clark, Nobby Clark down the road in Invercargill. He will tell you that Invercargill's water infrastructure is for now very sound because of investment in recent years. However, this government seems to think that all problems can be solved in this country if they, and only they, run the show. Hence the desire for centralisation. We've seen it with the politics, haven't we? Some of them, like the ones in Otago and Southland, were working just fine. We're seeing it in health. Yes, there needed to be some rationalisation of the unwieldy DHB system, but a completely new centralised entity at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars, as well as a Maori Health Authority, doesn't seem either rational or fair to the majority of the population. And according to this government, the only way to solve the issues regarding water infrastructure and the investments needed to upgrade and expand it is to centralise. Therefore, the water pipes, the treatment plants, developed and owned by 67 local authorities and their predecessors for well over 100 years, will be taken off those councils and put in the hands of these new water entities. And around the country there are four of them. The government disingenuously says they will still be owned by the councils who paid for them in the first place, and in fact they will give the council shares in these new entities to prove it. But that is a complete ruse. It's a fallacy. You see, when you own something, you can decide how it operates. You can improve it. You can make money from it. You can be in charge of it. Well, that's what we all thought ownership of an asset means. But now we've got to the stage where the mayors of three local authorities, Nigel Bowen in Timaru, Dan Gordon in Waimakariri, and Cheryl Mai in Whangarei, are asking the High Court to declare what ownership actually means. The case is being heard this week, yesterday and today, in the High Court in Wellington. I reckon it's a very, very important court case. The question the applicants want answered is this. What are the rights of asset ownership. And when you think about it, what could be a more basic question than that? At the moment, the government's plans to govern and manage these four water entities will take away completely the rights of your council to make any decision at all about either the operations or the future investment of the water infrastructure in the local area. So here's how the government has structured the operation and governance of these four water entities. Bear with me, it's not easy to understand. For a start, the water entity boundaries are based on iwi areas boundaries. Down here will be part of water entity D. It covers almost all of the South Island except for Nelson and Marlborough. Why is the entire South Island not an entity in its own right, you might ask? Could it possibly be that Naitahu, as the dominant iwi in the South Island, are not influential in the Nelson and Marlborough area? I would say quite probably. So the four water entities have been set up and even though the government has told us the local authorities will have ownership of the infrastructure, they will have no real say on how services are delivered in their area. So who will be making the decisions? Let me tell you how these water entities will be run. For a start, each water entity will have a regional representation group. There'll be 12 people on these groups. Six of the 12 will be appointed, presumably by the government, from the local councils. Now in this area, your council will be one of 20 local authorities merged into Entity D. The councils will have six people on the regional representation group. And there is no guarantee that somebody from your local council here will be one of those six. 
The other six members of that RRG, that Regional Representation Group, will be iwi representatives, presumably in this part of the country, appointed by Naitahu. Then, in a crazily convoluted setup, the Regional Representation Group will appoint and monitor an independent selection panel, which will in turn appoint and monitor the boards of directors at each of these water entities. Are you confused? I think you're supposed to be. Oh, and in a, in a last minute sop to local concerns, the minister in charge of all this, Nanaya Mahuta, says we will now have sub-regional advisory panels to the regional representation group, which is of course yet another layer of bureaucracy. Does that make it four or five? But the kicker is that these sub-regional advisory panels also must be a mix of local council and iwi appointments. In other words, yet more co-governance. And just so that you can have no doubt about what is the most important qualification uh, to be a board of director on each of these water entities, the cabinet, following Nanaya Mahuta's lead, has decreed that the board must have, quote, collective, general collective competence in understanding the principles of the treaty and Maturanga Māori, Tikanga Māori and Te Ao Māori, and include members with specific expertise of Mataranga Māori, Tikanga Māori, Kaitiangitanga and Te Ao Māori with respect to the delivery of water services. Now I don't know about you, but it seems that knowledge of Māori myths and the Māori world view is a far more important qualification for membership of these water entity boards than knowledge of, say, engineering and finance. Because if we do need to spend billions of dollars upgrading our water infrastructure across the country, wouldn't engineering and financial skills be the most important disciplines that prospective directors should have? And not only will iwi have six out of 12 members on each of these regional representation groups, any decision the groups make must pass with a 75 per cent majority. So it's very obvious that iwi interests will be at the forefront of any decisions made about each of the three waters entities. The claim by the local government minister that local authorities will continue to own the water infrastructure is, in my opinion, nothing more than an outright fallacy. And let's see if the High Court agrees this week. So, so if local authority representatives can have no influence or power on the decisions of the regional representation groups, then they can have no control over who selects the board, of course, therefore, who will govern the entity. In other words, their rights as owners have been completely taken away. And to quote Gary Judd's QC in a recent article, the Three Waters proposal has been deliberately designed to give iwi and Māori the predominating governance influence. Bear in mind that getting a return from an asset is a right attributable to an owner. Therefore, the proposal would confer on iwi and Māori, but no one else, a direct attribute of ownership." Unquote. So let's get back to basics here. Fresh water is a natural substance. It falls from the sky, it collects in rivers and lakes. It is life. Without water, life is impossible. And that's for everybody. Water is not exclusive to anybody, not exclusive to any ethnicity, any religion or any gender. Water is for all. Nobody can own water. And John Key said exactly that and logically who could argue with him? British common law, which New Zealand adopted after the Treaty of Waitangi, says naturally flowing fresh water is not owned by anyone but is treated as a public good. And that is still the legal position in New Zealand today. It's logical, it's easy to understand. It's a position which should have been confirmed by the courts of this country on many occasions. Instead, our learned friends of the judiciary have put water ownership through the complicator way too often. And it's led to the ridiculous situation regarding Lake Taupo. The most recent deed of settlement between Ngāti Tūwharitoa and the Crown said the iwi owned the lake bed, the subsoil underneath the lake bed, and the space 
occupied by the water, but not the water itself, I kid you not. In fact, the deed says the water itself remains in public ownership. But because the water occupies space above the lake bed, Tufori Toa now have the capability to charge commercial users of that water, like launch operators and charter fishing companies, not for the use of the water, mind you, but for the use of the space occupied by the water. Go figure. So, because our best legal minds have not confirmed something as straightforward as public ownership of all fresh water as the British law lords did hundreds of years ago, we have a situation now open to all sorts of interpretation, which ultimately has led us to this quite extraordinary attempt to confiscate, without meaningful reparation, billions of dollars in water reticulation and disposal assets built up and paid for over more than a century for reasons which are on the surface quite spurious. For instance, there are claims that up to 38,000 people are affected by waterborne diseases in New Zealand each year. Now that figure is a complete fiction. It's the upper end of an estimate from the Ministry of Health about the number of water-caused gastro infections each year. The actual evidence says we have about 17 waterborne GI outbreaks each year, affecting on average about 145 people. That's 2,400 people each year, not 38,000. There is no evidence whatsoever to say that between 34 and 38,000 New Zealanders get sick from water each year. It is a complete and utter fiction. Yet it seems to be one of the most quoted figures by Labour Party politicians when they push the case for three waters reform. I heard Michael Wood on the radio on Hosking's show this morning, again talking about New Zealanders getting sick because of our poor water quality. It is a very, very rare occurrence. We should also refer to the Heipuapua report, the report commissioned by the government to outline a way in which New Zealand can meet the non-binding declarations, non-binding obligations rather, of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Heipuapua report, which suggests some as yet undefined form of co-governance for New Zealand uh, by the 200th anniversary of the signing of the treaty, says this, Rangatira Tanga Māori will not detract from the Crown's duties to respect and protect the human rights of all individuals. It is a model inspired by an understanding of equity that means all peoples and individuals should be able to realise their potential. But that this might only be possible if different approaches are taken for different peoples and individuals. It does not mean that all individuals must be treated the same. So you think about that. A paper to government, which has not been dismissed, and many aspects of which are already being instigated, says that not all individuals in this country must be treated the same. This is a civilised, free and liberal democracy. The key to our society is that all people are equal before the law. And the law must be such that all people during their lifetimes are presented with equality of opportunity. Hey, Pua Pua seems determined to break with that concept. Think about some lines from various Labour Party politicians in recent times. My old TV colleague, Tamati Coffey, when introducing the failed Rotorua local body representation bill, talked about the bill being a tweak to democracy. Willie Jackson, the Maori Development Minister, says democracy will no longer be the tyranny of the majority. Even the Deputy Prime Minister, Grant Robertson, says the nature of democracy has changed. And then the former New Zealand First MP at a big wheel in Waikato Tainui, Tuku Morgan. Those of us of a certain age will remember him from the $70 underpants saga in 1997. The other day he echoed what many a Maori leader is saying, democracy doesn't work for Maori. He's got to be kidding, doesn't he? Democracy, Winston Churchill once famously said, is the worst form of government except for all the other systems which have been tried from time to time. I'll tell you how democracy has worked for Māori 
There are 120 MPs in the New Zealand Parliament. If those identifying as Māori comprise somewhere between 15 and 17 per cent of the population, a truly representative New Zealand Parliament should have between 18 and 20 Māori MPs each time round. Well, since the 2002 election, in other words, for the last 20 years, there has never been less than 19 Māori MPs. In the current parliament, there are 25. In the last parliament, there were 29. Māori have been overrepresented in parliament, proportional to the population, for two decades. Tuku Morgan, Willie Jackson, Rawiri Waititi, that is how well democracy works for Māori. It produces an overrepresentation in the House of Parliament. And do non-Māori care? I don't. I'm a New Zealander. Otago and Southland is my Turunga Waiwai. It's my place in the world. It's my home. My ancestors sailed up Otago Harbour in 1848. I'm a New Zealander. This is the only country I know. And, and I want everybody who lives in this country to have the same rights and privileges and equality of opportunity. And that's what a lively, thriving and free liberal democracy should be. And remember, New Zealand is one of the longest continuous democracies in the world since we passed our Constitution Act back in 1852. So no matter if your ancestors arrived in the 13th, the 19th or indeed the 21st century, this young nation is for all of us, or it should be. But we have a group among us, aided and abetted by senior political leaders, who want to change that. They want democracy, in the words of Tamati Coffee, to be tweaked. Maybe to be replaced by rangatiratanga. But then you might ask, what is rangatiratanga? What is a rangatira? Is it not a chief? So is rangatiratanga not chiefly authority? How democratic are the pro processes involved in rangatiratanga? I would suggest they're not very democratic at all. And then specifically on the matter of water, this is what He Puapua says. Increased Māori rangatiratanga will require considerable resourcing and capacity building. If Māori are to exercise governance power, there needs to be support for this and it may take time. Tikanga Māori will evolve and develop to greater application in the modern world, but it will also require support. The Crown's main contribution to capacity building will be in resourcing. There are multiple streams from which financial contributions might be sourced, including, for example, levies on resource use where Māori have a clear interest, if not a strong claim to ownership, such as water. Could that be any clearer? The Heipuapua report suggests in the kindest and most gentle way that the Crown should resource Māori and iwi capacity building towards so-called self-determination by putting a levy on water use because Māori have a strong ownership claim to water. Well, I believe that the concept of Māori ownership of water must be challenged and it must be challenged strenuously. Water is a naturally occurring phenomenon. We all know that. It was falling from the sky for millions of years before the arrival of the first peoples in this land. And again, to quote John Key, nobody owns the water. It still falls from the skies to the tune of around 600 billion cubic metres every year in this country. Our biggest challenge should be to capture and reticulate that wonderful natural resource all over New Zealand for the benefit of us all, not one particular ethnicity. By the way, we only use of that 600 billion cubic metres each year, we only use for human consumption, and that includes irrigation, only 27 billion cubic metres of water of the precipitation that falls on the country each year. But the learned judges in this nation's courts could even contemplate a concept such as ownership of fresh water is beyond me. I can understand that land under lakes and rivers can be managed by private and often iwi interests, but the concept of actual water ownership is just illogical. I mean, how can a litre of water in Lake Wanaka today be owned by anyone? 
when that same leader is passing by Balclutha tomorrow, it is in the Pacific Ocean half an hour later. Water is like the air that we breathe. It's never settled in one place. Therefore, how the hell can it be owned? But you can see from that Heipuapua report the end game of the so-called Three Waters Project. Yes, there is a need to improve water services in this country. Many local authorities have uh, water infrastructure needs requiring significant investment. That can't be denied. But there are many other local authorities who are doing just fine because of their consistent and significant investment through the years. Over time, they've accumulated extremely valuable assets. In Tauranga City, for instance, where I used to pay rates until last year, the book value of the water assets, according to the 2019 annual report, was $941 million. It's probably higher now. The government, through its $2.5 billion bribe scheme to local authorities, the government is offering Tauranga City $48 million to take over the $941 million asset. Sounds like a pretty good deal for somebody. Great deal for the government. A billion dollars worth of pipes and water treatment plants for less than 50 million. It's the deal of the century. And once they have that new asset, of course, the new water entity, up that way it's water entity B, they can then levy the poor ratepayers of Tauranga City even more than the $2.52 per thousand litres they currently charge you for water use there. And despite what the government and the local government minister says about water levies uh, being used to pay for badly needed upgrades to the water uh, infrastructure around the country, the Heipuapua report, as I've just outlined, makes it very clear that some of the water levy will be going to Māori and iwi interests so that the Crown can make a contribution to this capacity building of Māori rangatiratanga. The Heipuapua report suggests water levies will be used to resource an as yet undefined form of Māori self-determination, and no one in the government, especially Nanaia Mahuta, has outright rejected the concept of water royalties for iwi. Now, where I live, and I guess where many of you live, we don't pay a separate water rate. Each rate's bill breaks down where the money's going at the moment. Uh, in my annual rates bill for our house in Wanaka, for instance, around $800 each year goes to council water services. But what will happen if and when Queenstown Lakes is sucked into the vortex of water entity D? Ratepayers in Queenstown Lakes will be having water meters installed and they'll be paying by the cubic meter for the abundance of the local water reticulated to their homes from the lakes and rivers in the neighborhood. And if you start paying a water rate, a separate water rate to water entity D, Will there be a matching reduction in our rates bill from the Queenstown Lakes District Council? So in other words, will my annual rates reduce by $800 each year because I'm now paying water rates to water entity D? I think I just saw a pig flying across the sky. <laughs> What's more, some of that money, every time we turn on the tap or flush the dunny, some will be going according to the a poor, poor report to fund Māori self-determination. Is that fair? Is that logical? Why do Māori or iwi interests deserve a cut of every litre of water that you and I use? If this proposal is allowed to go ahead or is forced through by the minister against the wishes of the people, iwi will control the water assets of this nation and that must not be allowed to happen. Water is for everyone. Water cannot possibly be claimed as a taonga, a treasure. Article 2 of the treaty agrees to protect the chief sub-tribes and all the people of New Zealand and the unqualified chieftainship of their lands, villages and their treasures. Surely it's a step too far to suggest that water, that naturally occurring gift for us all, without which life cannot exist, is to be regarded as a taonga under Article 2 of the treaty. In my logical linear mind to suggest otherwise is just patently absurd. And at any rate, Article 3 of the treaty states that the Queen of England extends to the natives of New Zealand her royal protection and imparts to them all the rights and privileges of British subjects. In other words, in this country we are all equal. Or in the words of William Hobson, 
which he may or may not have said at Waitangi on the 6th of February 1840, hey iwi tahi tato, we are now one people. The land I live in, I want to be one where we have equality of opportunity, freedom of movement, and freedom of expression. We have a proud history of continuous liberal democracy dating back to the first New Zealand elections of 1853 and becoming the first country in the world to offer universal and equal adult suffrage 40 years after that. That unbroken run of equality for all in this country is under threat by various government initiatives. But with the exceedingly valuable water assets of the nation under threat of government confiscation, it is surely now the time to act, to protest loudly to your current local council and to vote in this year's local body elections for candidates who oppose the Three Waters reforms. You must say, <laughs> you must say loud and clear that you do not want your pipes and sewerage system owned by government appointed entities with the ability to take even more of your hard-earned money than is the case now. Now the Taxpayers Union, whom I'm representing today, is backing and funding the Water Users Group action against the government to challenge Three Waters. The crux of the case is that Nanaya Mahuta says she has advice from Crown, Crown Law that co-governance of Three Waters entities is required by the Treaty of Waitangi. But just where is that Crown Law advice? And what exactly did it say? The advice Ms Mahuta says she's relying on has never been made public. <laughs> did Crown Law actually say that? Or is the Minister just making things up? And that's what the Water Users Group case is about. The claimant, the WUG, wants the courts to examine the Minister's reasons for instigating Three Waters and if the courts agree that the minister got the law wrong, to say so. Now that can't stop the government proceeding because if it has the numbers, it can change the law. But if the claimant, the water users group, is correct, everyone will know the government is basing its actions on a legal falsehood. And what government would do that a year out from an election? Probably this one. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the mainstream media have not reported on the challenge, but the Taxpayers' Union has been supported literally by hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders to fight this cause. If you have donated, thank you. If you'd like to consider supporting the cause, go to taxpayers.org.nz and follow the links. This is a hugely important time for the future of New Zealand. If Three Waters happens this year because of the Labour Party majority brought about by that thing Willie Jackson doesn't like, called democracy, then it must be rescinded by an incoming National Party-led government. Thankfully, the National Party's new fence-sitter-in-chief, Christopher Luxon, finally issued a statement late last week saying a new National-led government would repeal and replace the Three Waters legislation. Sometimes I say thank heavens for small mercies. Yes, there does need to be aggregation and improvement of water services in some parts of the country, but it must be done in another more efficient and in a much more targeted way, and not through four central government imposed water entities. A couple of things to note just before I finish. If there are any uh, community leaders uh, here this afternoon, uh, Gore District Councillors or local board members, I would ask you to sign the banner off to uh, my right, to your left, uh, to say that uh, the uh, Three Waters scheme must not be allowed to go ahead. The Southland MP, Joseph Mooney, has already signed it. Uh, a couple of nights ago in Alexandra, <laughs> the Mayor of Central Otago, Tim Cadogan, uh, pointedly refused to sign it. He says it's much better to be inside the tent and not outside it. Uh, just in conclusion, to have assets worth billions and billions of dollars seized by central government in the name of the Treaty of Waitangi is a step too far for this New Zealander and I would hope 
for you too. <laughs> to paraphrase our Prime Minister, let's stop this. Thank you.